thanks for joining us this evening for a special live stream This Day in History presentation. Tonight's story will detail an event that kicked off the Spanish-American War. We plan to look at how North Carolinians responded to this event, all while facing an era of intense racial violence. So, on February 15th, 1898, the USS Maine explodes while docked in Havana, Cuba. The United States pretty much immediately blamed Spain, and President William McKinley changes his stance on peace and starts calling Americans to arms. Black communities are split across the nation. Should they fight and use this as a chance for recognition and to assert their rights as equal citizens? Or should they ignore the call of a country that has oppressed them and treated them very, very poorly? A country that cares more about the plight of Cubans than their own citizens who are in a very similar situation. But we'll back up briefly um, in case you might not be too familiar with the Spanish-American War. So a few years prior, in 1895, black and white Cubans banded together and revolted against Spanish colonial rule. Spain responds with a brutal military crackdown, and Americans are absolutely shocked at the developing humanitarian crisis. The United States is concerned for its own citizens living in, in Cuba, some of which had even joined the revolutionary movement. Americans are also gaining a lot of interest in certain black Cuban revolutionary leaders. Um, some of them are pictured here. And black newspapers across the United States uh, focus fairly extensively on the exploits of, of some of these heroic men. So the United States doesn't trust Spain as a colonial power in the Western Hemisphere and disapproved of their management in, in their colonies and a lot of their, their colonial policies and practices. Um, and a lot of these Spanish colonies have resources that are very desirable to the United States. All of these things contribute to our strained relationship with Spain. America has strong economic ties to Cuba's sugar industry and sends the U.S. Maine to Havana to protect American interests. So 123 years ago today, in fact, 123 years ago in about an hour or so, um, the, the USS Maine explodes and the resulting media frenzy and horror uh, causes Americans to quickly blame Spain and pushes us very, very close to, to, to war. So President McKinley calls for volunteers once the, once the war is declared, and each state receives a quota of units that it's supposed to contribute to the war. North Carolina begins raising troops immediately, um, but it's, the, the state begins to struggle to meet its quota. Governor Daniel Russell of the socially progressive Republican Party sends a delegation to the White House and to the U.S. War Department in D.C. to obtain special permission to send uh, some black recruits, black soldiers that are already available, in lieu of sending a, uh, an artillery battery in order to meet this, this state quota. President McKinley, who's also a fairly socially progressive Republican, agrees. Governor Russell, eager to reward and recognize the black community that had supported him and helped him get elected through this fusion political movement of the 1890s, authorizes James Hunter Young to raise a full-size regiment with black soldiers and officers and promoted him colonel of the 3rd North Carolina Regiment United States Volunteers becoming the first African-American colonel in the U.S. military, in the first entirely black regiment with black officers in the U.S., and the only regiment of its kind raised in the South during the war. We do plan on making a special video detailing the incredible life of James H. Young coming soon, so please check back, within, uh, you know, check, check back with us uh, and stay tuned for that. So, meanwhile... 1898 was a politically turbulent and very violent time. Conservative Democrat Charles B. Aycock, who later becomes governor two years after all of this under the campaign of white supremacy, spent the 1898 election campaign season traveling hundreds of miles around North Carolina, warning crowds of black domination that would come if they kept allowing Republicans to be elected. Republicans, since the end of the Civil War, had been gradually placing African Americans in positions of political power, um, there's a number of black politicians who are uh, elected to public office, both within the state of North Carolina and nationally. And people like Charles B. Aycock argue that African Americans were 
unfit to govern and that it would be dangerous to have black rule continue any longer, uh, using inflammatory language that inspired paramilitary organizations like the Red Shirts to take violent action and incites insurrection. Lynching was, lynching was common. So now, at the outbreak of war, black citizens are split. Should they join this war effort? White supremacists had for centuries painted all people of color as simple-minded, mentally inferior, and incompetent, unfit for leadership. USCTs, or the United States Colored Troops during the Civil War, had fought with distinction and courage, as had the Buffalo soldiers stationed out west during the Indian Wars. So perhaps serving now could prove their courage and capabilities. Patriotically volunteering would demonstrate their worthiness and value as equal citizens. More importantly, they should be allowed to assert their rights as equal citizens. But, on the other hand, why should they support the country that oppressed them for generations, using violence against them, um, and pretends to care about colonial violence against Cubans despite their, con you know, their suffering and their condition? The United States was so willing to go to war to help the oppressed Cubans, but offered nothing to help its own black population. In fact... When USS Maine exploded, newspapers seemed more concerned to inform Americans that the captain's dog Peggy uh, and the ship's cat Tom survived the blast than to tell the fate of any of the 30 black sailors on board USS Maine. So, again, why should they serve? But ultimately, many joined the ranks of the 3rd North Carolina, driven by a sense of brotherhood with the suffering Cubans. The 3rd North Carolina, under the command of Colonel James Hunter Young, didn't end up actually fighting overseas, but instead faced bullets in their own country from their own countrymen. Immediately, people like Charles B. Aycock, during his political campaigning and the conservative press, vilified Colonel Young in the third, calling them a political stunt, the private army of Governor Daniel Russell, sure to fail, and a dangerous threat to the nearby white community around Fort Macon, where they were stationed during the war. They faced daily discrimination. The war ended quickly, but while white North Carolina regiments were quickly disbanded and sent home, the 3rd North Carolina was dismayed to learn that they would be shipped to Camp Poland in Knoxville, Tennessee. As they left, white soldiers belonging to the 2nd North Carolina Regiment mustered out in Wilmington. Many became red shirts and participated in the infamous Wilmington coup and the massacre following the election of 1898. When the 3rd arrived in Knoxville, they encountered more discrimination. A white Georgia regiment, uh, the 1st Georgia, stationed with them, hurled constant verbal abuse, threw rocks at them while they drilled, and took pot shots at the 3rd soldiers who ventured too close to their camp. They even received abuse from the white officers of another black regiment, the 6th Virginia, which had black enlisted men but white officers, uh, and they were blamed for... The, the third is basically blamed for all of the disciplinary issues that are suffered by the sixth. Newspapers look for any opportunity to spread false information about the regiment, constantly criticizing every perceived infraction. Their superior conduct, the superior conduct of the third, and discipline over, over the months finally led one of the Knoxville papers to admit the men realize that their actions are being closely watched, and it is their desire to so conduct themselves as to gain the confidence and respect of everyone with whom they came in contact as true soldiers. So just as they start to win over the people of Knoxville, the third is sent to Camp Haskell in Macon, Georgia. This is over the winter of 1898-1899. Um, at the time, Georgia is considered really like the hotbed of racial violence. Again, the local white population was furious at the presence of armed black men. It was here that the 3rd North Carolina had their first casualties. Locals murder four of the 3rd North Carolina soldiers during the course of their time in Georgia. So despite the constant negative barrage of, of press, this just horrible slander in the press, and physical violence that the regiment faces, they keep their composure and remain committed to proving their courage. They impressed visitors who came to their camp, including Charles Meserve, who was the president of Shaw University, an HBCU located here in Raleigh, who arrived unannounced and later wrote, the spirit and discipline of, of the officers and men was admirable and reflected great credit upon the Old North State. There was an enthusiastic buoyancy that made their discipline and evolutions well nigh perfect. The Third North Carolina, 
formed in response to the explosion of the USS Maine on February 15, 1898, 123 years ago today, and recruited during a period of political turbulence and racial violence, embodied the hopes and aspirations of black communities to assert their rights as citizens, and they served honorably. They faced discrimination everywhere they went, and after the war, many of these military veterans lost their ability to vote when Charles B. Acock became governor and passed the suffrage amendment of 1900. But their mere existence as the first full-sized regiment with both black soldiers and officers, led by the first African-American commissioned as a colonel, James Hunter Young, is significant to our nation's history, and as Meserve wrote, a credit upon the Old North State. Thanks for joining us tonight on our special live stream, This Day in History. Please check back on our social media for, up, for the upcoming story on the life of Colonel James Hunter Young, an incredible and charismatic commander, politician, and community leader. Until then, remember the Maine, and remember the courageous North Carolinians who answered their country's call. So. We